Okay, while people are, are still uh, coming in uh, into the room, I also have to make sure we'll kick off on time because we have a very full agenda and, and lots of interesting speakers. So a very, very warm welcome and good evening to this um, second edition of the um, European Strategic Dialogue Lecture Series. My name is Johan Korps. I'm the Scientific Director of the Institute of Security and Global Affairs here at Leiden University and Professor of Security Studies. And I'm very, very happy to also on behalf of the co-organizers of this lecture series to welcome you to tonight's, um, uh, well, think tank dialogue and think tank debate, really. Um, this lecture series is now uh, has been started in October to bring together um, the, well, views of three important um, strategic communities, those of the French, the German, and the Netherlands, but also, of course, linking it always to wider European viewpoints and European debates. And uh, we started off uh, in October with the first event on the European Strategic Compass, which was a great discussion. And today we're focusing, we're looking a bit outwards from the European borders, looking at the Indo-Pacific and in particular, the EU's Indo-Pacific um, strategy. Um, this is not a coincidence also, given the fact that both um, the EU, but also the three countries, Germany, the Netherlands and France have also in the past year published their strategy in uh, towards this region have been heavily involved also on the EU strategy. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sophie Verité, my colleague at ISRA. She's a, a doctoral candidate and lecturer at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs and also an associate fellow at um, the Hague program for cyber norms, amongst other things, and she will be your moderator for tonight's debate. Um, on behalf of Dr. Enrico Ophels, Landry Charrier, and Iris Müller, the co-organizers, Cassis Bonn, um, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, and of course, the Institut Francais, um, I wish you a very pleasant evening and over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much. Um, as Joe said, my name is Sophie. I will be moderating today's discussion. I'm delighted to welcome our speakers and audience for the second edition of the European Strategic Dialogue Lecture Series, which uh, this evening will concentrate on the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy, a subject of heightened interest and tension, most recently exemplified by the, ad the adoption of the AUKUS Defense Pact. The Indo-Pacific region, which spans from the east coast of Africa to the Pacific island states, has been a growing source of great power competition in recent years. Since the U.S. pivot to Asia under Barack Obama, the EU has increased its strategic and economic outlook on Asia. So in its strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, just published in September, the EU offers an umbrella framework um, for foreign policy in the region. It adds to already existing national guidelines developed by France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Moving away from an economic partnership, the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy actually outlines seven priority areas, sustainable and inclusive prosperity, green transition, ocean governance, digital governance and partnerships, connectivity, security and defense, and human security. When it comes to security and defense, it mentions uh, naval activities in the end, but most notably under EU NAFOR uh, Somalia, frameworks for security cooperation, which the EU aims to intensify, for instance, by deploying military advisors to EU delegations in the region, and finally, new security challenges, uh, including cybersecurity, counterterrorism, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, as well as information manipulation and interference. Nevertheless, the big question is how the strategy will be implemented in practice. And the elephant in the room is, of course, China. And more specifically, the main question I think that everyone is wondering, um, wondering is how will the EU balance its economic interests, since China is the EU's biggest trade and partner, and its fundamental values in light of China's growing authoritarian influence and blatant human rights violations. Now, to provide more clarity on this question, and hopefully many more from the audience, please let me introduce the fantastic panel of speakers we have today. Unfortunately, none of the women speakers that we invited were able to join us today. Therefore, our speakers and our audience will pay extra attention to diversity and inclusion in this exchange. 
First of all, we are honored to have Antoine Mondaz, who is a research fellow at the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique and associate professor at Sciences Po Paris. Previously, he worked as a special advisor on Korea for the European Parliament. His research currently focuses on China, Taiwan, and Korea's foreign and security policies. We also have the pleasure to welcome Felix Heyduk, senior associate at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Before that, Felix was a lecturer at the University of Birmingham and a visiting postdoc at Harvard University. He recently explored the Indo-Pacific concept, very interesting paper, and compared the French and German approaches to the area. I'm also delighted to welcome our third speaker, Daniel Fiat, who is Security and Defense Editor at the EU Institute for Security Studies since 2016. He regularly publishes on European security and defense policy, CSDP operations and defense capability, and industrial issues. Daniel was educated at Cambridge University and obtained his PhD from the Free University of Brussels. And last but not least, we have Franz Paul van der Putten, Senior Research Fellow and Coordinator at the Klinkendile China Center. His, research, uh, his area of research is the geopolitical significance of the rise of China as a global power. And before joining Klinkendal, he was editor-in-chief of the journal Itinerario and a researcher at Nine Road Business University. Welcome to all of our speakers. I invite our audience to give a virtual round of applause for this fantastic panel. Um, in the following exchange, each of the speaker will give a short statement before we open the floor for questions from the public. Uh, from the public. If you have any questions, during the discussion or, uh, or um, during the statement or after the statement, please feel free to type your questions in the chat. Um, and if you would like to ask your question live, please make sure to briefly introduce yourself and indicate whether your question is addressed specifically to someone from the panel or to the panel in general. Uh, I also invite you, if you want, to bring the discussion on Twitter with the hashtag European Strategic Dialogue. Without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Antoine. Antoine, thank you very much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie, and it's a great pleasure to discuss with you all about the Indo-Pacific. The, the last few weeks have been quite uh, epic, to be honest, in France about, about the, the very notion, but also how should we adapt our strategy in the Indo-Pacific, be it the national level, of course, the French level following AUKUS or, or the European uh, level. But I would say that the last few weeks and last few months, despite what happened to the French with, with the AUKUS deal has been still quite positive. Positive in the sense that at the EU level, at the collective level, there is a growing awareness on the need not only to have a strategy, because you, you've seen what was published in, in, in September, but on finding the best ways to implement it, especially starting in the very few months, uh, in the next few months, uh, under the French uh, presidency. Um, a uh, ministerial forum on the Indo-Pacific should be announced shortly by, by the French side. At the end of February, Paris uh, should organize a ministerial meeting on the Indo-Pacific, gathering uh, European and Indo-Pacific uh, countries. And that will be actually the very first time that the highest level we are discussing the Indo-Pacific. So that will be quite a major event, but also a political push for more on the Indo-Pacific in raising awareness and in making sure, because that's the question of the day, that the strategy for cooperation is fully implemented and that synergies with our partners in the Indo-Pacific are fully um, exploited. Um, we just finished actually on, on the French and German side, kind of a consultation process with our partner in the Indo-Pacific from Australia to Japan, from India to Indonesia, from Vietnam, to uh, South Korea on how actually to better implement uh, the strategy, what our partners are expecting actually uh, from the Europeans and the feedbacks were actually very positive, uh, be it from the Southeast Asian partners, but also more generally from all of the partners uh, in the regions. I would still be quite critical in, in the few minutes I have left on what we can do better, not in terms of synergies, because I'm sure we will discuss it um, afterwards, but on what we collectively in Europe 
on the current draft in the uh, European strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we could do uh, better. And I would list actually some uh, quite detailed uh, remarks. The first one is, and this is what's going on, we should have, to be clear, an international process of consultation with our Indo-Pacific partners to refine the strategy. It was actually, many of us may have forgotten, but the added value actually, the key added value of the Belt and Road Initiative that was announced in 2013, then an, a consultation process was initiated by the Chinese official. And it's only in May 2015 actually, that the Belt and Road as a joint action plan from the state council and the NGRC was published by Beijing. So this kind of consultation process on what the other countries expect from us, how do we make sure to initiate and, and, and identify synergies is very, very important in, in the coming, uh, coming weeks. The second one is we should characterize a little bit more, not what we mean by Indo-Pacific, there is kind of a geographical uh, definition of it in, in, the, in, in the European, um, uh, I would say in the European minds, but what are the specificities of the Indo-Pacific? And for me, of course, the maritime dimension of it uh, is key. And we should make clear that the Indo-Pacific is first and foremost a maritime region with all of the consequences, of course, it entails in terms of strategy, in terms of priorities, etc. The third remark is we should make clear to announce or highlight some key initiative dedicated to the Indo-Pacific. So some might say that Global Gateway is de facto one of the major initiatives that will be part of the Indo-Pacific, for sure. But Global Gateway is not an Indo-Pacific strategy. It's not an Indo-Pacific, I mean, initiative dedicated to the Indo-Pacific. It's a much larger uh, European project that deal, of course, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America, etc. So we need to make sure to have some key initiatives that are being listed as Indo-Pacific, I would say, uh, initiative. The fourth one is to better promote and leverage the European overseas territories in the Indo-Pacific. That is basically the French territories in the region. And that's something the French should also do uh, much better than we are currently uh, doing. We need to put more emphasis on New Caledonia, on French Polynesia, on the Rhenian Islands, uh, etc. Then some very brief uh, remarks as well. Uh, we need to provide more in the European communication to the region figures and kind of fact sheets. And that's something that is missing. We need to remind everyone that the European, in terms of trade, in terms of investment, in terms of overseas development aid, is one of the most important partner of the countries in the region, especially in terms of FDI and in terms of FDA. Uh, we should strengthen uh, the focus we have in the strategy on civil society, because that's not something that is much discussed, actually, uh, be it to discuss education, being to discuss uh, sustainable development, and how do you make sure that the civil society is taking into consideration, etc. Then, but we will discuss it later, the focus on synergies with countries in the Indo-Pacific, and eventually one point that is quite important and quite lacking, actually, in the, um, in the documents to strengthen more concrete cooperation in the field of security. So maritime security is being addressed, for sure, but space security is not addressed as much. Non-proliferation is mentioned, just the word is mentioned, but there is nothing specific, even though in the Indo-Pacific today, proliferation, be it of nuclear weapons, be it of ballistic missiles, is, is, should be uh, one of the top uh, priority, because I should remind everyone that North Korea is part de facto of, of the uh, Indo-Pacific. And very uh, lastly, we should start thinking maybe on what about expanding some of the PESCO projects to Indo-Pacific partners. So of course, not something related to continental defense in Europe, etc., but on space awareness, cyber security, uh, that could be some of the projects in which uh, the Japanese, maybe the Koreans, uh, couldn't be integrated. We did it with the Canadian and the Americans, so I'm sure we could do it some, with some Indo-Pacific partners. And I've been way too long already. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive and great overview, Antoine, and very specific, concrete recommendations. I highly appreciate that, and I think our audience will feel the same way. Um, next, I'm very happy to welcome Felix. Felix, thank you for being with us tonight. The floor is yours. Um, sure, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to be the one that disappoints the audience then because my remarks are a bit more general, I think, um, and maybe less specific. But nonetheless, I would argue 
still uh, worthy of, uh, of consideration. Um, let me start by stating that the way we frame and refer to a phenomenon ends up impacting on the choices we make in dealing with that phenomenon. So if we follow the headlines on the Indo-Pacific currently, it's all about strategic competition. It's about systemic rivalry. It's about new Cold War in the region and so on and so forth. And all is rather narrowly cast and single-mindedly in a way about the great power rivalry between the US and China. And it assumes, I think in many ways, indirectly or directly, uh, directly definitely on the part of Washington, some sort of future bi bipolarity, bipolar order in the region. And the Indo-Pacific as a concept, I would argue has become massively embroiled in all of this. So I wanna make five uh, short observations. And the first one is that because of this, Indo-Pacific is increasingly, and I see this in slightly differently to my uh, esteemed colleague Antoine, is increasingly less of a geographical term and increasingly a geopolitical term associated with essentially conflict over hegemony in the region. Great power conflict, essentially, or rivalry, whatever you want to term it. So, and the trend of what I would call the geopolitization of the Indo-Pacific also knows very few limits at the moment. Almost any policy field or any policy area from connectivity to public health and anything in between is increasingly seen through this prism. This is not to say that it has to be like this. Some actors like the ASEAN or like um, the European Union to an extent have tried to frame the Indo-Pacific as a more inclusive region. But as a matter of fact, and this is just to reiterate my first point, the Indo-Pacific is increasingly by the majority of actors in the region framed as an anti-China containment strategy. And it is also understood this way in Beijing, whether one likes it or not, but I, I think this is the dominant frame, the dominant prism if we talk and look at the Indo-Pacific right now. Regardless, like I said, whether you support this prism, if you're affirmative towards it or not. Second observation, uh, and this is uh, regarding Sophie's point about China elephant in the room. We have still have in Europe, um, and this is, uh, I think, a major challenge. We have conflicting imperatives regarding our Indo-Pacific strategy and associated policies. On the one hand, uh, we are told by Ursula von der Leyen and others that Europe needs and wants to relearn the language of power, needs to relearn geo doing geopolitics and act accordingly. So send warships to protect our interests like open sea lanes, like rules-based international order, make our tra trade less dependent on China, diversify to other partners, deepen transatlantic cooperation on the Indo-Pacific and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, you have EU officials and member state officials speaking of the need to continuously engage China, that the price for us to fully decouple economically is way too high, that global climate change policies won't work without China and so on and so forth. I'm not saying it's either or by no means, but still I would argue we have conflicting imperatives to, to an extent and we need to basically uh, make more sense than we do right now of them uh, in Europe. Uh, th uh, third observation is the question, where are we structurally uh, at the moment? Um, so basically saying we need a clear recognition of the political context we are operating in as the EU and its member states. Are we in a new Cold War? Are we part now of some anti-China balancing coalition? Do we aim for, do, do, do we strive for peaceful coexistence or else? In my view, the answer, I can't give the answer, but part of the answer is definite, definitely we need to realize that we have a broken regional security architecture at the moment. And I would argue bipolarity won't fix it, at least not in a sustain, sustainable manner. I don't think so. So we need to find some sort of arrangement to fix this broken regional security architecture or crumbling regional ar architecture, sorry, broken is maybe too strong a term. So we need to find some sort of engagement with China, like it or not. Fourth observation, there is no more 
because of the crumbling regional security architecture, there's no more full-blown Pax Americana, but there's also no Pax Sinica, at least for the time being. So we are in, in definitely, in my view, interregnum. So there is no widely accepted concept of the future order in the region, and there are actually diverging at times competing conceptualizations of where we are heading with the Indo-Pacific. And if you uh, read my paper that Sophie kindly already mentioned, um, me and a colleague really try to dissect the Indo-Pacific um, um, uh, along national strategies and the divergences are actually quite remarkable in, in so many ways. So uh, back to my fourth point, in reality, I would even argue we have the beginnings of multipolarity in the Indo-Pacific. We have many middle powers, many middle power poles, Japan, Australia, ASEAN, uh, countries like India as well, and so on and so forth, that basically engage and shape the regional order. Um, and then uh, my last point, my fifth and last observation uh, is, we need to be clear, I think, and um, uh, Antoine has already alluded to numerous potential aspects of this. We need to clear what are we offering? Um, because uh, I would say uh, in response to Antoine, we even need to be more precise than that because in order to generate new partnerships, there will be no one size fits all. We need actually a tailored approach to fit with the interests of actually quite diverse partners in the region. The interest of Indonesia with regards to trade policy uh, might, for example, be very different from, say, Japan. Uh, the uh, interest of India with regards to maritime security might be different to those from, say, South Korea uh, or Malaysia, and so on and so forth. So I would, I would uh, really want to stress here the point, um, we need a tailored approach to fit the interest of individual partners in the region. And seeing, uh, final remark, seeing that at least a significant number of states, especially in the region I mostly work on, which is Southeast Asia actually, do not want to subscribe to an exclusive vision of regional order. The EU, I would argue, is well advised not to beat the same drum on FONOPS, safeguarding the rules-based international order, and so on and so forth, as Washington does. After all, many in the region vividly remember how the US after 9-11 actually wrote roughshod over the rules-based international order and its global war on terror. They also, many presume Trump might actually be back in the White House again in 2025. We should also think about that. So there, there is some sort of, there's skepticism over sustained US commitment in the region. So because of this, I would argue, we need to be humble. Last sentence, sorry, Sophie. We need to offer alternatives beyond Beijing and Washington, not by issuing another laundry list of priorities like we did in the EU strategy where the priorities are so broad that there's basically, to me, there are no priorities. Really, it's basically everything is a priority, then there are no real priorities. We need to basically have a two, three, four visible, and this is where I totally support Antoine's point, visible, very visible projects at, 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 is as part of a tailored approach where we can actually make a difference. Could be multilateral security frameworks that rather than trilaterals and, and minilaterals, could be in economic partnerships, what have you. Thank you. Thank you, Felix, for these very interesting remarks and very important caveats to the concept of Indo-Pacific. So that's, that's very nice. I think it brings the discussion to the next level. Um, then we have Daniel Fiat. Uh, Daniel, welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, I will give you the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sophie. And uh, also thanks to the organizers for, for putting this um, timely and important uh, discussion together. It's always uh, difficult to follow uh, great speakers like Antoine uh, and uh, Felix, who have already, I think, said a lot. But let me try in five minutes to <laughs> give you some impression of where I'm coming from. In the Pacific in five minutes, by the way, is a, is a very cruel, cruel task. You would not uh, set it even to your students, but we'll try. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and echoing what uh, some of the speakers have already said, that actually the EU was not using even the term in the Pacific 
like um, even a few years ago. Uh, so uh, the concept has come uh, very, very far, I would say. Uh, in a way, it is quite interesting that actually uh, most people uh, at least link the concept of Indo-Pacific with the Trump administration. But anyone who's done any uh, close reading, at least, of the global strategy, which we know came before Trump, uh, even refers to Indo-Pacific for some reason. Indo-Pacific and East Asia is the specific uh, reference there. So it's quite interesting already that it was on uh, the EU's radar. Uh, I'd also say that that it links very much to what's been said already about the language about learning the use of uh, or the language of power, uh, also the question of the geopolitical commission. Now, one can say that that's uh, pure EU semantics, but of course, this doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from uh, a sense, at least, of insecurity in that region. And I would say, more importantly, for the EU, that it feels like its interests are increasingly at risk uh, in a distant part of the world, uh, if we can put it this way. Um, I would also make a point as well that uh, EU uh, Indo-Pacific was also very important to the EU before the AUKUS um, um, catastrophe, if we can put it this way, um, you, you will probably have to ask our American, British and Australian friends about the timing of the AUKUS deal, what is it, uh, almost a day before the EU strategy was uh, published. I, I, I've been told that's coincidental, I'm not too sure. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the question there is um, that the EU has an interest beyond even uh, the, these shock uh, events. The strategy itself, I mean, we can't go into it in too much detail, but it does outline, I think, very clearly why the EU is interested. Uh, it has natural partners in the region. I think uh, Antoine has already mentioned that as well in terms of uh, overseas territories and close partners. The fact that there are major trade routes and waterways is very, very important, can't be neglected. I mean, the EU, if it's any kind of power, is an economic power. So, of course, that dependence is very clear. The discussion about critical supply chains has only underlined uh, that factor as well. We know as well, and I think uh, Felix uh, referred to this very well, it is a kind of growing area of geopolitical competition. Whether that's the right way to go or not, I think that's a deep question, but it certainly seems to be the framing um, um, factor here. And then, of course, that there are also questions of human rights and democracy in that region, I think, that are still very, very clear and, uh, and dear to the EU's values, not least what happens in China directly, but I think even uh, around the, the region. And it's not just about uh, human rights and democracy, but it's also about the principles of uh, territorial security, if we can also put it uh, in very, very blunt terms. So we should not uh, keep that in mind. Let me make some very brief points of the challenges. I could uh, speak for ages about how positive everything is. But I think for the discussion, it would be great if we problematize a bit further the discussion. The first is, and this, this may sound like a very EU bureaucratic way of uh, discussing it, but the EU is in danger, I think, of, uh, of having too many policies geared towards uh, the Indo-Pacific. I mean, let, let's think about them. Uh, we now have the Indo-Pacific strategy. We have the maritime security strategy. We have the communication on ocean governance. Or we have the communication on global ways we will have the strategic compass in March. So we have all of this proliferation of documents. And of course, what that normally signifies is a lot of great intellectual power going into an issue. But whether or not that's coherent when it comes to implementation, I think is, is absolutely critical. Second point, it's not at all clear in the EU today that all member states believe or understand the Indo-Pacific to be uh, important for their security needs. That's an obvious point to make, of course, given uh, many countries in the EU still consider territorial security and the security of the borders of the EU to be the paramount uh, issue. However, there I think is very interesting uh, to see even some member states and uh, officials that I've had conversations with coming from landlocked countries who fully understand that their economic um, survival and safety is dependent upon uh, trade in the Indo-Pacific, especially if we accept that that's the center of gravity in the future. Third point, yes, where does the EU fit within China EU uh, condominium or bipolarity, if you want to call it like that. I think actually what gets lost in this discussion is not so much the EU's agency and the EU or interest in the region, but also the interest that comes from partners there. So it, it, they are also fully aware of the fact that being caught between a, a Sino-American uh, geopolitical uh, balance um, and the EU is seen somehow, for better or worse, as a way out of that uh, kind of logic. Uh, of course, that puts even more pressure on the EU to meet those needs. And what 
said about having tailored approaches, I think is understood in Brussels, uh, and it is in fact uh, should be the core feature not just of all partnerships in the Indo-Pacific, but globally speaking. I mean, uh, gone are the days when we we should treat uh, countries uh, with broad brush strokes of regions. Um, we do have to think a bit tailored, uh, a bit more tailored, and I think maybe the Japan. Um, economic partnership and strategic partnership offers us a way into thinking about how we can tailor that as well. Um, a final point, I guess, and then we can discuss a bit more and I'll be quiet, is also a fundamental question for the EU. Huh? Uh, and that is, uh, does the EU see itself as a sea power or a maritime power? Now, they may, they may appear to be the same thing, but they're not, in fact. Um, if you're a sea power, you can pretty much get to that stage by investing in naval assets pretty quickly. I think you see the Chinese doing that as well. But we know, and this is why the Indo-Pacific strategy is pretty important here, that you can't become a maritime power just on naval vessels. They're important. I would be the first to stress that you do need naval vessels. But actually, you need to be thinking as well um, a bit more broader about economic relationships, uh, also the norms that are spread uh, within the region. Just consider, for example, I think in the case of China, we'll probably hear more about this uh, soon. It's not just a question of putting more naval vessels in the water, but it's also proliferating the contracts that state-backed companies have, for example, in key infrastructure around the region. So it, there is a difference between being a sea power and a maritime power. To be clear, the EU is not a sea power today. It's probably not even a maritime power in the Indo-Pacific, but it needs to choose which one it wants to become. I think it's better if it becomes a, a maritime uh, power overall. Then we could uh, go through a list of suggestions I have within the compass, but I will save that for the discussion. And thanks for listening so far. Thank you very much. Uh, some very useful remarks, I think, on the, self, the impact of self-perceptions on the development of that strategy. Now I will leave the very difficult task uh, to Franz Paul of speaking uh, last <laughs> on this extraordinary panel and discussion so far. Franz Paul, uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Welcome, and I'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, my remarks, the remarks that I want to make relate to the, um, the let's say, the strategic interests that the European Union has um, in the in, uh, in in the region, the, the region that is covered by the by the term Indo-Pacific, um, and uh, especially East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, because I think uh, those those regions together uh, already constitute the demographic center of gravity globally, and they are also the increasingly the economic center of gravity. Um, so I think that the Indo-Pacific strategy is a tool that is very important for the European Union to, uh, to make sure that the, the EU is part of the, uh, of the region, to, to make sure that the EU is, let's say, uh, that the EU now is, is, is taking the steps that 10 years ago President Obama was all, or also taking when he said, when, at the time when he was still talking about the, the, uh, the Asia-Pacific, but uh, of course, largely about the same, referring to the same region, uh, when President Obama said that uh, the, uh, the region is, is going to be the, the center of gravity, the economic center of gravity in the 21st century, and the United States has to be uh, um, part of that, has to be a key player in that region. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the European Union is moving in the same direction, a little bit later than the United States, a little bit less. Uh, forcefully, but the Indo-Pacific strategy is a is a is a step in that direction and signal, signals this. So, of course, the economic interest of being a part of being an active player in the region uh, that is the first interest that I wanted to highlight. The second one is if we think about the the current dynamic where uh, relations between Europe and China are becoming more more difficult, um, and there is a possibility that in the future Europe uh, let's say the European Union and the United States on the one hand, and China on the other hand, um, will have somewhat less uh, less tight economic integration. In, in, uh, so the economic integration between Europe and uh, China may decrease somewhat. And um, if that happens, so because of because of economic and geopolitical reasons, uh, we can see that both sides are 
looking at ways to decrease their their dependencies to decrease the the, the economic vulnerabilities that they see in in having a re close relations with each other um, the more that this happens the more that economic competition between europe european companies and chinese companies will move from the bilateral level to third regions and i think given the fact that countries in east southeast and south asia um, will be so economically important in the future that a lot of that sino uh, european economic competition will take place in those in those third regions not only there not only in asia of course also in other parts of the world but i think that's going to be a very important strategically important region for for europe to be very present um, and then finally my third observation is about european strategic autonomy um, so so in a, in a in a future where europe still works very closely with the united states on geopolitical issues on, on global issues and of course also on issues relating to china the europe the, the the united states will be the the stronger partner of the duo uh, so uh, i think in that context so in the context of cooperating with the united states it will be very important for Europe, which, of course, still has interests which do not always completely uh, overlap with those of the United States, that Europe does have a capability uh, for um, autonomous decision making. And I think one of the ways for Europe to, to reach, to, to build that kind of capacity is by focusing on third regions, by focusing on, on strengthening relations between Euro the European Union and other parts of the world. Again, not just uh, Asian regions, this also applies to other parts, but I think certainly uh, Asia uh, is very important. Um, it is a way for, for Europe to, uh, to, to, have some, to have some more room to maneuver in its, in its positioning with regard to the United States and in, and in regard to China. And there, I think ASEAN is a very interesting partner for the European Union. To, to, to look very closely at. Uh, so for two reasons. One, I think the ASEAN approach to regional stability and, in, in, and regional inclusiveness, as has been uh, written down in the uh, strategic uh, ASEAN uh, outlook on the Indo-Pacific, uh, provides, I think, very, uh, very good, um, very uh, suitable guidelines that, that Europe can also work with to partner with, with ASEAN and, and, and of course also with other uh, actors and partners who, who would be interested uh, to join that, to, to develop ways to make sure that the, uh, the, uh, the, central, the centrality, so the central position of ASEAN in the regional governance architecture is, is, is preserved and that um, there, there is inclusiveness, that there will, there, there will re remain ways for countries not to be forced to have to choose between the United States and China. And I think this regional approach of so focusing, working together with, with ASEAN in the Indo-Pacific context also creates a basis for, you, for the European Union to, to further build on this approach at a global level at some point. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I really like this idea of focusing on existing um, institutions, regional frameworks in order to uh, avoid this dichotomy and, 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 and competition between the EU um, and the US. Um, so great. I will now open the floor for questions. I see that we already have some that came up in the chat. Thank you very much to all the speakers for their great statements. I will now ask them to answer some of these questions. Since we have a quite a big panel, I will try to direct some of these questions to some of the speakers and then ask if anyone wants to add something. So uh, we have one first question directed to Antoine. Um, Maria is asking, what are some of the policy mistakes that the EU has made in its involvement with the Indo-Pacific region? And what lesson has it drawn so far to inform proposed future engagements? Antoine. I'm, I'm not sure there are many mistakes because we're just at the beginning of a process. So, so not, a, not much has been announced, even though, of course, the strategy for cooperation is quite important. And as um, Eric mentioned, you know, even 12 months ago, 
it was quite unlikely at the EU level to have a common strategy. So it was made very, very fast. And, and I think even though, of course, we can still improve it, it, it's a very good start, very, very good start. And that show that even at the 27 members level, we are able to formulate a common strategy. So that's a very, very positive signal. Of course, we can still improve it, but it's yet a very positive um, signal. Um, on the lessons for, for future engagements, once again, I, I think we need to be clear that even though we will build up on existing initiatives, we need to formulate two or three flagship initiatives. Uh, when you develop a common strategy, you need to have some flagship initiatives. Otherwise, people cannot, I would say, identify the strategy with something concrete. So we need to be clear on that. Could it be on something unrelated to security? I'm sure. Uh, and, and I don't believe that our added value will be in, on military security. We need to be very clear on that. On security, why not? In a very broad sense, but clearly not on military security. Be it on human security, environmental security, uh, I'm quite sure. And, and to link it to one of the, of the question, we need to understand that the Indo-Pacific as, uh, um, as a region uh, has a very strong link to environmental issues. Uh, to paraphrase, actually, to what was said in 2018, so three years ago, in the Bo Declaration on Regional Security. So it was a, a declaration issued by the island country of, of the Pacific. They mentioned that actually climate change was the biggest security threat to the region for the Pacific Island, much more than China, or the US, or anything else. So many countries recognize um, climate change as one of the top priority. To be very just that specific on, on some numbers, 37% uh, of the natural sites at the World Heritage are in the Indo-Pacific, while it's only 24% of the cultural sites. So in terms of natural sites to protect, there is a large number being in the Indo-Pacific. In the Indo-Pacific, you have four of these sites, natural sites, that are being endangered today in Madagascar, in Tanzania, in Indonesia, and on the Solomon uh, Islands. In terms of natural disasters, six out of the seven countries that are the most frequently hit by natural disasters are in the Pacific. In terms of person affected, it's as well seven out of seven most affected uh, countries. So it's something quite important. In terms of, uh, let's say, coal consumption, uh, seven out of the 10 biggest consumer of coals today are in the Indo-Pacific. China, India, Japan, South Africa, South Korea, Indonesia, and Vietnam. You have a lot of transversal environmental issues being, of course, the, the rising, the, the, the level of the sea, of, of sea rise, uh, the, the rising level of the seas, 70% of the Vietnamese, uh, are living on coastal areas, etc. All of the countries in the Indo-Pacific, all of them, at the exception of Laos, have a maritime, uh, are, are maritime countries de facto. So, so I think we need to make sure to have a positive agenda on the Indo-Pacific. And I fully agree with what Felix, with what Franz Paul said before. It's not only about China. Uh, of course, it's partly about China, but it's not again China. It should not be again China. And it should not be only about China. And we need to make sure that the Europeans come with a positive agenda. Because this is what, especially in Southeast Asia, people are expecting. They're not expecting us to just join you know, the US-China competition and confrontation. They expect us to provide alternative and to come with a positive agenda. And in terms of trade, in terms of human security, in terms of environmental security, we have a lot to offer. And, and I think we need to be very clear on that. And once again, to remind everyone some basic facts, the Europeans are the first provider of ODA worldwide, but also in the Indo-Pacific. They're the first provider of, of the first investors in terms of FDI. And, and that's something that is positive. And we need to have this kind of positive agenda in the region. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. That links very well to the second question, which I think you answered already, um, which we received <laughs> from, from, from the audience, which was, are there already projects in the battle on climate change? And you mentioned a few already. So thank you for that. I will then take uh, the next question from Dr uh, Dirk Brengemann, who was a speaker in our first edition, which if you have missed, uh, you can watch it online. The question is, how closely should Europe coordinate their Indo-Pacific policy with the US? And I will ask this question to you, Daniel, if you don't mind. So how should the EU coordinate their Indo-Pacific strategy with the US, especially if the US and China escalate? What about ta Taiwan? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental question, of course. I think um, we, we have to be slightly careful about the different formats in which this discussion will happen, because, of course, now with AUKUS, uh, both France and the US have a bilateral discussion, I would say, that um, will not go anywhere uh, anytime soon. It will remain. It will have to remain in order to create that kind of um, confidence between the two uh, countries after AUKUS. Uh, but also don't forget that early next year, uh, the EU and US will be launching their own dedicated uh, uh, dialogue on defense. Um, and if you then couple that, I think, with the Trade and Technology Council, it seems to me uh, inevitable that they will have to discuss questions of the Indo-Pacific um, uh, and more specifically China. <laughs> And uh, we know actually that probably the EU and um, the US at least have a similar framing of the China question, uh, you know, competitors, uh, cooperative partners and rivals, that seems to be the easy way out of saying everything uh, and not prioritizing. Um, but actually, there are, as, as many speakers have already said, uh, key differences between the US uh, and the EU. I would expect the EU to continue to make its um, its place in this discussion um, very, very clear, that it's not on the road of uh, joining any kind of Cold War 2.0. Uh, and also, we, we the, also the problem with framing it as a Cold War 2.0 is that we're not really alive to all of the dynamic factors involved. Yeah, I mean, and it ties a bit with one of the questions in the chat as well about trade. And, um, you know, um, I think this was also mentioned uh, maybe by one of the other speakers as well. The trade is on a somewhat downward trajectory, I would say, free trade. Uh, but the question there is more about um, critical supply chains uh, and uh, security of supply. And if you get into that kind of discussion as well, both the EU and the US have very different approaches there. Uh, I think it's no secret as well that in Washington, they somehow play that uh, um, sanctioning of critical supply chains uh, to the benefit of their own industry. That's to be expected. Um, but in that, it means that the EU may lose out. Um, with, but so I would say that any discussion about China with the US can and, uh, in isolation from an EU discussion with the Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, and I think that's also one of the main rationales behind the Pacific strategy, that we do have an inroad into the region and the countries in the region want the EU there as well to make sure that it's not framed as, uh, you know, the EU, US or the, the EU somehow following blindly uh, Washington uh, uh, on this question. Uh, but on the other hand, and I'll, I'll stop here, um, I think the EU, you can see, is also becoming a bit more assertive vis-a-vis uh, -vis China in its own right. Uh, it doesn't need Washington uh, to tell the EU this. If you look at the uh, very interesting and, um, I would say, uh, somewhat um, uh, negative um, uh, case of uh, China and uh, Lithuania, for example, I mean, the, these uh, actions also speak louder uh, and increasingly so within the EU's institutions, so that... Uh, uh, there's less and less naivety, I would guess, uh, over this uh, point as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone want to add anything on this? Anyone from the from the speakers? Yes, Felix, please come in. Really, just one or two thoughts in addition to what uh, uh, Daniel already alluded to. I think the expectation in the region, and you, there was there was especially in Southeast Asia, there was a lot of focus on uh, on on. Um, uh, the Secretary of State's uh, speech two days ago or so in Jakarta uh, was that 
there, that Washington would raise its economic game, especially in the region, because let's face it, uh, COVID or post-COVID political legitimacy in many of the countries in the region hinges massively on economic recovery because there's the public health price that might be a little bit less, or it might have a little bit less of a price tag on it compared to here, but then testing numbers and so on, or it's not comparable really, but for sure the socioeconomic price tag of the pandemic is massive in uh, South Asia, in East Asia and in Southeast Asia. So the expectation was Washington would raise its economic game, right? And But if you look at the speeches as, as, as well, you look at the strategic documents, there's really very, very little difference between the Trump administration, which was basically allergic to multilateral trade deals, had this transactionalist, so to say, understanding of it, and the Biden administration, because domestically in the US, it doesn't fly at the moment. So in that sense, I think the convenient marginalization that the EU once had in, in Asia, basically free riding in many policy areas, security, but also trade and others, sort of on the US, I think that's over. So I would therefore um, uh, reassert the, 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 the emphasis by, by Franz Paul on, on uh, strategic autonomy, also with regards to, to the field of economics. So I'm not sure whether very, very close coordination with, with the US on in the Pacific at the moment uh, um, in all policy areas is the right thing to do. And I've just mentioned one where it's definitely tricky. Thank you very much. Wonderful. I will then take the next question and perhaps redirect it to Franz Paul. Um, a very interesting question from Joris Larik, who's asking, I would like to hear views on future UK-EU dynamics in the region. The French submarine deal and AUKUS controversy look like a bad sign, heralding future competition or rivalry. Can both find a way to work more closely together, even with recurring post-Brexit tensions? Well, first of all, I think it's 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 very important um, and probably also inevitable that there will be a lot of working together and coordination between UK, uh, UK and EU in the region. But um, it also depends. So the the level and the, the strategic degree of cooperation also depends on. Um, the positioning, I guess, uh, in, in, uh, of, the, of the UK with regard to um, regional stability and regional, uh, yeah, re the regional um, uh, um, uh, the regional order. Um, if, we, if we compare the situation in, in uh, let's say, East Asia, Southeast Asia, with um, the Cold War during uh, Europe during the Cold War, um, you can see that uh, the uh, the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War were able to to um, demarcate their spheres of influence in Europe, and then they were able to stabilize their relationship and they used deterrence, military deterrence, to to um, to have this quite long term, relatively stable relationship in the region in Europe. But if you look at Asia and relations between the U.S. and China at the moment, there is no uh, absolutely no likelihood that there will be this this kind of of demarcation between spheres of influence. So the influence of China and the influence of the United States are are overlapping uh, in many places. Um, but they are using military deterrence to try to stabilize their relationship. And I think in this context, this will not be sustainable. I think military deterrence um, in this in this uh, Asian context can only last for some while, but but as time progresses, the situation will become less stable. So there needs to be a plan, an idea, a vision of how to move from deterrence as a stabilizing principle to another principle that, that allows China and the United States to, to both of them to exist in the region without having this uh, big risk of military conflict. So if, 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 um, if I look at AUKUS, that seems to be a move where the United States and, and, and the UK uh, and Australia, of course, um, further reinforce the principle of military deterrence as a way to deal with China. So it will depend if the United States and, and, and of course China also, if they keep moving in a direction where, where military deterrence is, is the answer 
for managing the relationship. Um, this, this is, I think, not the interest that the, the European Union, in when it comes to regional stability, should work towards to. So coming back to the, to the UK, if the UK uh, positions itself as a very close military ally of the United States, and if it, it strengthens this, this process of militarization and, and making deterrence the sole principle for, for the regional balance of power, then I think, um, I hope that the European Union will, will follow another strategy. And in, but in that case, it will be less uh, easy for the UK and Europe to work very closely in the region. Sounds like a very complex landscape indeed. <laughs> Would anyone else from the panel like to add something on UK EU dynamic on the region? No, otherwise I'll go to the next question. Um, okay, we have a question from Bernard Borchard, who is asking, is there still a perspective for EU free trade agreements in the region? In 2007, this was a big and promising issue but the outcome so far has been very limited. Who would like to answer this on free trade? I will pick Felix then, if that's okay. Barely just because I'm not an economist. I'm actually a secu um, security studies guy. So I like my bombs and tanks and frigates. <laughs> but um, well, I, I'm not so sure actually um, given but this is again my limited knowledge. I'm not an economist. Um, that the EU FTAs in the region have been like basically uh, some sort of like a, a, a failure. Um, after all, the EU has managed to um, uh, establish FTAs with numerous countries in the region: Vietnam, Japan, uh, Singapore, and so on and so forth. So um, then there's the, the talks with Australia. Yes, they are a bit hampered at the moment, but still there's the EU ASEAN. Uh, those ne re uh, negotiations have restarted a few years ago on an actually inter-regional uh, FTA. So uh, I wouldn't say it doesn't fly really. The question is just for me, and this ties back to uh, um, uh, remarks by all three uh, um, uh, esteemed colleagues of mine on the panel is, what are, are the EU norms and standards often too high? Is, it, is the threshold too high? Um, and do we need some sort of, I wouldn't say lowering of the standards really, because I don't think domestically here in Europe, this would fly very much. But um, uh, I think we need to look, if we, if we think about a, a trade policy, we need to look beyond FTAs because clearly for a lot of partners in the region, um, though the standards we set, which often cater to our particular interests, not necessarily their particular interests, the standards we, we set for FTAs uh, are, are tricky. Um, so again, without being an economist, this is not my expert field, but what I gathered, especially from, um, from talks in Southeast Asia where mainly uh, uh, work on is that maybe we need to think in Europe about uh, other um, 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 I would, agreements or forms of cooperation below the, this very high threshold of a FTA with the European Union. This is really all sorry. That's very kind no, of. No, this is, this is great. Broad, Thank you so much. Broad. Thank you so much. And I think that's a very fair point. This is also why, um, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is, is so different and, and prioritized in certain instances in comparison to EU uh, agreements. Would anyone want to add something to the free trade agreements? Otherwise, yes, Daniel? Yeah, just, just very briefly, I would uh, point to the context, you know, free trade, generally speaking, is not in, a, in the best position uh, in the world. Huh? Uh, and uh, you can just look at the state of the WTO uh, at the moment. So we've got to contextualize it in that way. And I think um, what Felix said, not just now, but even beforehand, uh, when he said uh, it's important to tailor um, our partnerships with different countries, um, I think that's largely been the case with at least the free trade agreements that have been uh, crafted. And I would say that the Japan uh, FTA is probably a leading example there of where there was a really tailored approach. But Let's also keep in mind that the EU is constantly revisiting 
uh, free trade policy. Uh, it, it just revised its um, strategic outlook for trade uh, not so long ago. And that's because there are now bigger questions. Uh, also, it's not just about this kind of uh, laissez-faire um, um, kind of uh, simple approach to free trade, but it also now includes security of supply. Um, you just look at the semiconductor discussion. I think that's very important, uh, but also access to raw materials. And I think what Antoine said as well, the climate change aspect is really important. And it was very interesting also to hear uh, the president of the commission uh, of the commission von der Leyen uh, talk about the global gateways as a kind of exportation of the EU's digital slash climate uh, agenda, which I found to be a very interesting way of framing what is essentially investments in infrastructure. Um, so I think that there is a, a an overhaul actually of of how the EU approaches its economic relationships, and it's not just what the EU wants, but I think it's also being driven as well by uh, partners uh, uh, in the in the in the Pacific as well. Thank you very much. Um, great. I will now go to another question on Taiwan. So perhaps I will direct that one to Antoine. Um, the question is, is the EU in terms of the capabilities ready and also willing to make a greater contribution to security and stability in the yeah. Taiwan Strait under the new Indo-Pacific strategy? To what extent does the EU take a uh, possible conflict in the Taiwan Strait seriously? Uh, so, so, so to put it briefly, there have been a huge evolution over the last few months in Europe on the public debate on Taiwan. And I would say that we have stopped making Taiwan invisible because for many years, governments, be it at the EU level, be it at the national level, were very reluctant even to mention Taiwan as an economic partner, to mention the Taiwan Strait as an area of concern, etc. Uh, it has come to an end. Uh, you've seen it in the G7 statements in June 2021. Uh, you've seen it in the strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific that mentions Taiwan as an economic partner and the Taiwan Strait as an area of concern. So, so Taiwan is back in the public debate and I think it, it's very welcome. Then we need to be realistic. If there is tomorrow a contingency in the Taiwan Strait between China and Taiwan that ends up in a military conflict, the role the European can play is very limited. For obvious reason, I mean militarily. For obvious reason, because very few questions, very few, sorry, uh, countries have even the capacities to project forces to the region. Uh, except France, you have some capacities, of course, in, in Germany, in the Netherlands, but it's very limited. So militarily, I think our role would be very, very limited. And that's why I think where we have a key role to play is in preventing a conflict from happening. We need to have a public debate on Taiwan in Europe. We need to send signal that we are opposed to uni any unilateral change, especially by force of the statu quo, status quo in the Taiwan Strait, etc. We need to make sure that we are raising the cost of a unilateral change of the status quo by China. Um, and, and this is, I think, one of the top priority, because once again, on the military level, uh, the, the role we play is quite limited. I'm sending also in, in the chat an article we wrote actually with Bruno Tertre. It's follow up actually one of the, the uh, a hearing I got at the European Parliament in February this year on actually the, the role we could play. But I think to work on contingency planning among Europeans, but as well as with partners like Japan, like the US, uh, to have a much stronger signaling strategy toward China um, and eventually to use the think tanks to have discussion with Taiwan when the official cannot do it publicly, I think is, is some of the leverage we might have. Once again, we are not the most important player and we will never be, but we have a role to play. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question here directly to Daniel. It seems the European Commission is on panic mode as China is aggressively taking over a critical supply chain over time relied upon by EU. Don't you think the EU strategies are more reactive and therefore more suicidal? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure I understand the suicidal bit, um, but, uh, but certainly uh, China has raised this question uh, of uh, supply chain security and critical supply. 
um, of course, the pandemic as well has helped. Uh, let's uh, maybe helped is not the right word, but um, has let's say illuminated our deficiencies even in basic. Um, uh, let's say supply stocks or critical supply stocks. Uh, so that's that's just a, an aspect now that I think is developing at the EU level. Um, I, I would say that it is actually quite welcome, um, and it uh, you know uh, I think uh, we we do have to at least have the courage in the EU to claim uh, certain critical supply chains and critical areas of the economy as strategic, and that it does imply that there will be a higher degree of. Um, control and um, uh, um, let's say uh, investment uh, in the, in that area and I think again you see that in in certain area uh, in certain economic uh, areas the real question is will it be successful and will it be successful quick enough um, that is very very difficult because um, global supply chains as we know are very very complicated uh, you're talking about sometimes raw materials but then uh, you know, cutting edge component technologies that are developed again, look at the, the semiconductor supply chain and it's, um, uh, it, it, it's absolutely mind boggling uh, how complicated that is. However, um, I think there is also a realization there that, um, you know, we're living in an era when anything can happen. Uh, so just to use one example, if there is uh, a hot war or, or conflict uh, with Taiwan, uh, you're pretty much talking about what upwards of 80% production uh, of semiconductors worldwide. Uh, it does lead then to a legitimate question for high tech societies. So what do you do if your main supplier for these uh, chips and um, components is involved in a war? Uh, it's a legitimate question, I guess, uh, from the EU side. Um, so things are moving, uh, but I'm afraid with these types of um, investments in critical supply chains, you need investment over a very, very long period of time, that's for sure, even beyond the current mandate of this commission, it needs to be a continuous thing. Uh, and secondly, there is also this impression that when you're dealing with critical supply chain um, issues, uh, that you go into the kind of protectionist cul-de-sac uh, where you try to, uh, I, I guess in America, you would call it reshoring, where you reshore every part of your supply chain. That's not realistic or possible. So it also means that we have to probably be thinking about different partners. But that raises serious questions, because uh, at least on the question of raw material extraction, uh, then you come up against the, the almost conflict between our, our needs for digital economy uh, and uh, the extraction of certain raw materials or critical supply chains. There's a tension there. Huh? And so it does then mean, I think, um, as has already been referred to, that when we're thinking of critical supply chain security, yes, it's about technological investment, um, uh, also about, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, developing partners, but then it also touches on development policy, climate policy. It, it's the whole um, area. It, it's all of EU policy. Uh, we're getting there slowly, uh, but it does take a lot of time. And we, I think we will only really see the fruits uh, after even this commission uh, as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Would anyone would like, uh, would anyone like to add anything on the supply chains? No. Otherwise, I will go ahead and ask. The just next. maybe on, on the supply chain, yeah. just one, okay. one thing that is quite um, worrisome over the last few few weeks if um, in the last few days, if it's confirmed, actually, that the willingness of, of China to use extraterritorial sanctions against Lithuanian interests in making sure that within the supply chains of European companies, um, Lithuanian goods are not being used, um, that would create a huge precedent. And, and that would be a huge challenge to the European solidarity, etc. Uh, and on that, we need to be clear that over the last few years, we've been focusing a lot, and, and rightly so, I would say, on American extraterritorial sanctions, especially under the Trump administration. Um, and many, especially in Europe, as far as I, I've worked on it, were very reluctant to even think of Chinese extraterritorial, extraterritorial sanctions, saying, you know, that's, that's stuff only the American do. That's, that's the things of the Americans. That's not the thing of the other country. Uh, and when a few years ago you warned the French officials, French experts, French company that it's gonna happen because China will have the capacity to do so and they will use every leverages they might be, they might have and they will use extraterritorial sanctions. You had some elements in Hong Kong because the, the, the Hong Kong national security law include de facto extraterritorial sanctions. 
But once again, people were like, you know, they're not going to apply it. It's it's a trap, and it's not very important. And now they are doing it. it and we're waiting for the Lithuanian government to communicate a little bit more, uh, targeting some some Lithuanian companies. So if it's uh, being proven, then once again, we are hoping the Vilnius government to to be more transparent on that. Uh, that would force us to rethink the way we, we of course, work on the supply chain and, and the way we can protect uh, our uh, member states, even though it's only one member state being targeting, uh, and how do we become more resilient? And, and that will be an accelerator, I would say, on how do we talk about it, and I fully agree with what Daniel said before. Thank you, wonderful. Um, I will ask then one more question, perhaps, and then I will try to wrap up. Um, so this question is about the CPTPP. I had to Google that. <laughs> the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. That is this trade, uh, this agreement between uh, Canada, Mexico, Australia, if I'm correct, and a bunch of um, Indo-Pacific states. What are the impact of this agreement for the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy? And I will redirect this question to France Paul. Thank you. Yeah, I was worried that you might do that. Uh, <laughs> Very sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm not a I'm not a specialist on on trade uh, trade agreements, but CPTPP, indeed, it has a very um, in, very big strategic significance. Uh, let's say the symbolic value of CPTPP alone is already um, so so important that it's it's necessary also for for Europe to to think about how to position itself uh, with regard to that. Um, of course, with the, the Obama administration in the United States uh, ha having been a driving force behind the the the, the predecessor, um, the, the concept of this of this agreement, and now the United States is not part of it, and then China has signaled that it wants to apply to to be part of that. Uh, that just shows that it just raises the question: uh, so what what about the European Union then? Should the European Union also signal something or? Try to do something, uh, but I, like I said, I'm not a, uh, I'm not involved in, uh, I'm not, I'm not researching uh, trade policy. So it's, uh, I don't know what what the current state of um, uh, of of Europe's potential engagement engage, engagement with CPTPP is, if there is any. Fair enough. It, a lot of economic questions for a panel of experts focused on security. So we'll we'll bear that in mind for the next time. <laughs> uh, would anyone want to add something about the CPTPP? No? <laughs> I'm not surprised. But uh, all right. OK, I, I, I guess if there are no more uh, questions from the audience, I will try wrapping this very, very interesting discussion. I must say, I'm not an expert at all on this area. And this was a very, very insightful uh, exchange. So thank you so much for uh, your statements, as well as the answers that you provided to the variety of questions from the audience. Um, I managed to observe three key points that were discussed in, in this exchange. The first one is the broadening of security interests for the EU and the Indo-Pacific, and, and that beyond the traditional sense of security, whether that's uh, security in terms of um, kinetic warfare or security in terms of borders. We're really moving uh, way beyond that understanding of, understanding of security when it comes to the EU strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And that includes climate, which actually I'm surprised we didn't uh, cover more, perhaps. Um, perhaps that's uh, one minus of this exchange. Um, so climate, but also information security, trade security, technology, supply chain, we talked about that. Uh, and moving away from deterrence that Franz Paul mentioned. The second theme that I observed throughout the exchange is this question of narrative that clearly influences uh, the formulation and the implementation of the strategy. And that question of narrative is obviously heavily influenced by the self-perception, the EU self-perception as a global actor and an actor in the Indo-Pacific, um, which several speakers mentioned should be more focused on positive aspects and confidence. 
um, in order to deal with these conflicting aspirations. And we think, of course, of China mainly uh, because of all the train interests, but also human rights violations. And that would also hopefully address this geopoliticization of the area that Felix um, talked about. Um, and lastly, yes, I forgot who, but someone mentioned this you know, question of solidarity. I think it was Franz Paul. And uh, so I think that goes along as well, this question of narrative and how can we reframe the narrative concerning the Indo-Pacific so that it really serves the interests not only of the EU, but also of the trading partners there. Um, and that's the last point that I observed at the theme that was covered is this, this variety of interests across a variety of partners and how to tailor our approach to this with existing regional cooperation frameworks, um, primarily ASEAN. Um, also, um, Antoine suggested suggestions of having continued consultations to align with uh, what was done, for instance, for the BRI. And uh, this also very difficulty, very important difficulty of aligning with the US and the UK, but also keeping an autonomy from them, which I think is a very hard balance to achieve. Um, and also very interesting points uh, when it comes to US and UK, um, when it comes to trade uh, policy standards and how the EU um, maybe ha has been setting these standards a little bit too high. So what is the UK and what is the US doing in this regard and how can the EU position itself? Um, so with these closing remarks, I will now close the discussion. Thank you so much once again to our wonderful panel of speakers. Thank you, Joe, for the fantastic introduction. And thank you for our partners for organizing these exchanges. Uh, I invite everyone to follow uh, our social media uh, channels if you want to stay posted with regard to the recording of this event, which will be posted online in the next few days or weeks, and as well as the next edition of the European Strategic Dialogue Lectures, which I hope will be at the beginning of 2022. So with this, I will uh, close the discussion. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions, your interests, and your time. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>